Hi, I am doing a series on the book of Job with Sherry Suter, and we're reading through the book of Job and then uh, doing a discussion commentary on it. And But I also want to add to it um, some essays and other things that I've read. And today I'm going to be reading the introduction to the book of Job by G.K. Chesterton. And G.K. Chesterton is a famous Catholic theologian, and his introduction on the book of Job is one of my favorites. I, I recommend anyone interested in the book to read it or just hang out here, and I'm going to read it for you. Um, I'll provide a link to the text below, and uh, here we go. The book of Job is among the other the book of Job is among the other Old Testament books, both a philosophical riddle and a historical riddle. It is the philosophical riddle that concerns us in such an introduction as this. So we may dismiss the first few words of general explanation or warning which should be said about the historical aspect. Controversy has long raged about which parts of this epic belong to its original scheme and which are interpolations of considerable considerably later date. The doctors disagree, as it is the business of doctors to do, but upon the whole, the trend of the investigation has always been in the direction of maintaining that the parts interpolated, if any, were the prose, prologue, and epilogue, and possibly the speech of the young man who comes in with an apology at the end. I do not profess to be competent to decide, to decide such questions. But whatever decision the reader may come to concerning them, there is a general truth to remember in this connection. When you deal with any ancient artistic creation, do not suppose that it is anything against it that it grew gradually. The book of Job may have grown gradually, just as Westminster Abbey grew gradually. But the people who made the old folk poetry, like the people who made Westminster Abbey, do not attach the importance to the actual date and the actual author that importance which is entirely the creation of an almost insane individualism of modern times. We may put aside the case of Job as one complicated with religious difficulties, and take any other, say the case of the Iliad. Many people have maintained the characteristic formula of modern skepticism that Homer was not written by Homer but by another man of by another person of the same name. Just in the same way, many have maintained that Moses was not Moses, but another person called Moses. But the thing really to be remembered in the matter of the Iliad is that if other people did not interpolate the passages, the thing did not create the same sense of shock as would be created by such proceedings in these individualistic times. The creation of the tribal epic was to some extent regarded as a tribal work, like the building of the tribal temple. Believe then, if you will, that the prologue of Job and the epilogue and the speech of Elihu are things inserted after the original work was composed. But do not suppose that such insertions have that obvious and superior character which would belong to any insertions in a modern individualistic book. Without going into questions of unity as understood by the scholars, we may say of the scholarly riddle that the book has a unity in the sense that all great traditional creations have unity, in the sense that Canterbury Cathedral has unity, in the same, and the same is broadly true of what I have called the philosophical riddle. There is a real sense in which the book of Job stands apart from most of the books included in the canon of the Old Testament. But here again, those are wrong who insist on the entire absence of unity. Those are wrong who maintain that the Old Testament is a mere loose library, that it has no consistency or aim, whether the result was achieved by some supernatural spiritual truth, or by a steady national tradition, or merely by an ingenious selection in aftertimes. The book, books of the Old Testament have quite percept, a quite perceptible unity. The central idea of the great part of the Old Testament may be called the idea of the loneliness of God. God is not only not the only chief character of the Old Testament, 
God is properly the only character in the Old Testament. Compared with his clearness of purpose, all other wills are heavy and automatic, like those of animals compared with his actuality. All the sons of flesh are shadows. Again and again the note is struck. With whom have with whom hath he taken counsel? Isaiah forty fourteen. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was no man with me. Isaiah sixty three three. All the patriarchs and prophets are merely his tools or weapons. For the Lord is a man of war. He uses Joshua like an axe or Moses like a measuring rod. For him, Samson is only a sword and Isaiah a trumpet. The saints of Christianity are supposed to be like God, to be, as it were, little statuettes of him. The Old Testament hero is no more supposed to be of the same nature as God than a saw or a hammer is supposed to be of the same shape as the carpenter. This is the main key and characteristic of Hebrew scriptures as a whole. There are, indeed, in those scriptures, innumerable instances of the sort of rugged humor, keen emotion, and power in powerful individuality which is never wanting in great primitive prose and poetry. Nevertheless, the main characteristic remains, the sense not merely that God is stronger than man, not merely that God is more secret than man, but that he means more, that he knows better what he is doing, and that compared with him, we have something of the vagueness, the unreason, and the vagrancy of the beasts that perish. It is he that sitteth above the earth, and the inhabitants therefore are as grasshoppers. Isaiah forty twenty two. We might almost put it thus, the book is so intent upon it asserting the personality of God that it almost asserts the impersonality of man. Unless this gigantic cosmic brain has conceived a thing, that thing is insecure and void. Man has not enough tenacity to ensure its con continuance. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. Psalm 127.1 Everywhere else, then, the Old Testament positively rejoices in the obliteration of man in comparison with the divine purpose. The book of Job stands definitely alone because the book of Job definitely asks, asks but what is the purpose of God? Is it worth the sacrifice even of our miserable humanity? Of course, it is, of course it is easy enough to to wipe out our own paltry wills for the sake of a will that is grander and kinder. But is it grander and kinder? Let God use his tools. Let God break his tools. But what is he doing and what are they being broken for? It is because of this question that we have to attack, that we have to attack as a philosophical riddle, the riddle of the book of Job. The present importance of the book of Job cannot be expressed adequately, even by saying that it is the most interesting of ancient books. We may almost say that the book of, of the book of Job, that it is the most interesting of modern books. In truth, of course, neither of the two phrases covers the matter because fundamental human religion and fundamental human ir ill religion are both at once old and new. Philosophy is either eternal or it is not philosophy. The modern habit of saying, this is my opinion, but it may be wrong, is entirely irrational. If I say that it may be wrong, I say that it is not my opinion. The modern habit of saying, every man has a different philosophy, this is my philosophy and it suits me. The habit of saying this is mere weak-mindedness. A cosmic philosophy is not constructed to fit a man. A cosmic philosophy is constructed to fit a cosmos. A man can no more possess a private religion than he can possess a private sun and moon. The first of the intellectual beauties of the book of Job is that it is all concerned with the desire to know the actuality, the desire to know what is and not merely what seems. If moderns were writing the book, we should probably find that Job and his comforters got along quite well together by the simple operation of referring their differences to what is called the temperament, saying that comforters were by nature optimists and Job by nature a pessimist, and they would be quite comfortable, as people can often be for some time at least, by agreeing to say what is obviously untrue. 
For if the word pessimist means anything at all, then emphatically Job is not a pessimist. His case alone is sufficient to refute the modern absurdity of referring everything to, to physical temperament. Job does not in any sense look at life in a gloomy way. If wishing to be happy and quite ready to be happy constitutes an optimist, Job is an optimist. He is a perplexed optimist. He is an exasperated optimist. He is an outraged and insulted optimist. Optimist. He wishes the universe to justify itself, not because he wishes it to be caught out, but because he really wishes it to be justified. He demands an explanation from God, but he does not do it at all in the spirit in which John Hampton might demand an explanation from Charles I. He does it in the spirit of which a wife might demand an explanation from her husband, whom she really respected. He remonstrates with his maker because he is proud of his maker. He even speaks of the Almighty as his enemy. But he never doubts at the back of his mind that his enemy has some kind of case which he doesn't that his enemy has some kind of case which he does not understand. In a fine and famous blasphemy, he says, Oh that mine adversary had written a book, thirty three thirty five. That's Job thirty one or sorry, Job thirty one thirty five. It never really occurs to him that it could possibly be a bad book. He is anxious to be convinced that that is, he thinks that God could convince him. In short, we may say again that if the word optimist means anything, which I doubt, Job is an optimist. He shakes the pillars of the world and strikes insanely at the heavens. He lashes the stars, but it is not to silence them, it is to make them speak. In the same way, we may speak of the official optimists, the comforters of Job. Again, if the word pessimist means anything, which I doubt, the comforters of Job may be called pessimists rather than optimists. All they really believe is not that God is good, but that God is so strong that it is much more judis judicious to call him good. It would be the exaggeration of censure to call them evolutionists, but they have something of the vital error of the evolutionary optimist. They will keep on saying that everything in the universe fits into everything else, as if there were anything comforting about a number of nasty things all fitting into each other. We shall see later how God, in the great climax of the poem, turns this particular, particular argument altogether upside down. When, at the end of the poem, God answer, enters somewhat abruptly, is struck the sudden and splendid note which makes the thing as great as it, as it is. All the human beings through, through the story, and Job especially, have been asking questions of God. A more trivial poet would have made God enter in some sense or another, in some sense or other, in order to answer the questions. By a touch truly to be called inspired, when God enters, it is to ask a number of questions on his own account. In this drama of skepticism, God himself takes up the role of skeptic. He does what all the great voices defending religion have always done. He does, for instance, what Socrates did. He turns rationalism against itself. He seems to say that if it comes to asking questions, he can ask some he can ask some question which will fling down and flatten all conceivable human questioners. The poet, by an exquisite intuition, has made God ironically accept a kind of contra controversial equality with his accusers. He is willing to regard it as if it were a fair intellectual duel. Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Job 38.3 The everlasting adopts an enormous and sardonic humility. He is quite willing to be prosecuted. He only asks for the right which every prosecuted person possesses. He asks to be allowed to cross-examine the witness for, for the prosecution. And he carries, yet further, he carries yet further the corrections of the, legal, of the legal parallel. For the first question, essentially speaking, which he asks of Job, is the question that any criminal accused by Job would be most entitled to ask. He asks Job who he is, and Job, being a man of candid intellect, takes a little time to consider and comes to the conclusion that he does not know. This is the first great fact to notice about the speech of God. 
which is the culmination of the inquiry. It represents all human skeptics routed by a higher skepticism. It is this method, used sometimes by supreme and sometimes by mediocre minds, that have ever since been the logical weapon of the true mystic. Socrates, as I have said, used it when he showed that if you only allowed him enough sophistry, he could destroy all sophists. Jesus Christ used it when he reminded the Sadducees, who could not imagine the nature of marriage in heaven, that if it came to that, they had not really imagined the nature of marriage at all. In the breakup of Christian theology in the 18th century, Joseph Butler used it when he pointed out that the rationalistic arguments could be used as much against vague religions as against doctrinal religion, as much against rationalist ethics as against Christian ethics. It is the root and reason of the fact that men who have religious faith also have philosophic, philosophic doubt. These are the small streams of the, of the delta. The book of Job is the first is the first great cataract that creates the river. In dealing with the arrogant asserter of doubt, it is not the right method to tell him to stop doubting. It is rather the right method to tell him to go on doubting, to doubt a little more, to doubt every day newer and wilder things in the universe, until at last, by some strange enlightenment, he may begin to doubt himself. This, I say, is the first fact touching the speech the fine inspiration by which God comes in at the end, not to answer riddles, but to propound them. The other great fact, which taken together with this one, makes the whole work religious instead of merely philosophical, is that other great is the other great surprise which makes Job suddenly satisfied with the mere presentation of something impenetrable. Verbally speaking, the enigmas of Jehovah seem darker and more desolate than the enigmas of Job. Yet Job was comfortless before the speech of Jehovah and is comforted after. He has been told nothing, but he feels the terrible and tingling atmosphere of something which is too good to be told. The refusal of God to explain his design is, it, is itself a burning hint of his design. The riddles of God are more satisfying than the solutions of man. Thirdly, of course, it is one of the splendid strokes that God rebukes alike the man who accused and the men who defended him, that he knocks down pessimists and optimists with the same hammer, and it is in the connection with the mechanical and super supercilious supercilious comforters of job that there occurs the still deeper and finer inversion of which i have spoken the mechanical optimist endeavors to justify the universe avowedly upon the ground that it is rational is it is a rational and consecutive pattern he points out the fine that the fine thing about the world is that it can all that he points out that the fine thing about the world is that it can all be explained. That is the one point, if I may put it so, on which God in return is explicit to the point of violence. God says in effect that if there is one fine if there is one fine thing about the world as far as men are concerned, it is that it cannot be explained. He insists on the in inexplicableness of everything. Has the hath the rain a father out of whose womb came the ice job 38:28 he goes farther and insists on the positive and palpable unreason of things hast thou sent the rain upon the desert where no man is and upon the wilderness where there is no man job 38:26 god will make man see things if it is only against the black background of non-entity God will make Job see a startling universe if he can only do it by making Job see an idiotic universe. To startle man, God becomes for instant a blasphemer. One might almost say that God becomes for an instant an atheist. He unrolls before Job a long panorama of created things, the horse, the eagle, the raven, the wild ass, the peacock, the ostrich, the crocodile. He also describes each of them that it sounds like a monster walking in the sun. 
The whole is sort of a psalm or rhapsody of the sense of wonder. The maker of all things is astonished at the things he himself made. This we may call the third point. Job puts forward a note of interrogation. God answers with a note of exclamation. Instead of proving to Job that it is an in an inexplicable world, sorry, let me say that again. Instead of proving to Job that it is an inexplicable world, he insists that it is a much stranger world than Job ever thought it was. Lastly, the poet is achieved in the speech with that unconscious artistic accuracy found in so many of the simpler epics, another and much more delicate thing. Without once relaxing the rigid impenetrability of Jehovah in his deliberate declaration, he has contrived to let fall here and there in the metaphors, in the parenthe parenthetical imagery, sudden and splendid suggestions that the secret of God is bright and not a sad one. Semi-accidental suggestions, like light seen for an instant through the crack of a closed door. It would be difficult to praise too highly in a purely poetical sense the instinctive exactitude and ease with which these more optimistic insinuations are let fall in, in other connections, as if the Almighty himself were scarcely aware that he was letting them out. For instance, there is that famous passage where Jehovah, with devastating sarcasm, asked Job where he was when the foundation of the world was laid, and then, as, merely, as if merely fixing a date, mentions the time when the sons of God shouted for joy, Job 38, 4-7. One cannot help feeling, even upon this meager information, that they must have had something to shout about. Or again, when God is speaking of snow and hail and the mere catalog of physical cosmos, he speaks of them as a treasury that he has laid up against the, last, against the day of battle, a hint at some huge Armageddon in which evil shall be at last the overthrown. Nothing could be better, artistically speaking, than this optimism breaking through antagonism like fiery gold round the edges of a black cloud. Those who look superficially at the barbaric origin of the epic may think it fantasiful, fantasiful to read so much artistic significance into its causal similes or accidental phrases, but no one who is well acquainted with great examples of semi-barbaric poetry, as in the Song of Roland or old ballads, will fall into this mistake. No one who who knows what primitive poetry is can fail to realize that while its conscious form is simple, some of its finer effects are subtle. The Iliad contrives to express the idea that Hector and Sarpedon Sar have certain, a certain tone or tint of sad and chivalrous resignation, not bitter enough to be called pessimism and not jovial enough to be called optimism. Homer could never have said this in elaborate words, but somehow he contrives to say it in simple words. The Song of Roland contrives to express the idea that Christianity imposes upon its heroes a paradox, a paradox of great humility in the matter of their sins combined with great ferocity in the matter of their ideas. Of course, the Song of Roland could not say this, but it, convey, it conveys this. In the same way, the book of Job must be credited with many subtle effects which were in the author's soul without being perhaps in the author's mind. And of these, by far, the most important remains to be stated. I do not know and I doubt whether even scholars know if the book of Job had a great effect, had a great effect or had any effect upon the after development of Jewish thought. But if it did have any effect, it must have saved them from an enormous collapse and decay. Here in this book, the question is really asked whether God invariably punishes vice with terrestrial punishment and rewards virtue with terrestrial prosperity. If the Jews had answered that question wrongly, they might have lost all their after influence in human history. They might have sunk even down to the level of modern, well-educated society. For 
when once people have begun to believe that prosperity is the reward of virtue, their next calamity is obvious. If prosperity is regarded as the reward of virtue, then it will be regarded as the symptom of virtue. Men will leave off the heavy task of making good men successful. He will adopt the easier task of making out successful men good. This, which has happened throughout modern commerce and journalism, is the ultimate nemesis of the wicked optimism of the comforters of Job. If the Jews could be saved from it, the book of Job saved them. The book of Job is, is chiefly remarkable, as I have insisted throughout, for the fact that it does not end in a way that is conventionally satisfactory. Job is not told that his misfortunes were t due to his sins or part of any plan for his improvement, but in the prologue we see Job tormented not because he was the worst of men, but because he was the best. It is the lesson of the whole work that the man is most comforted is that man is most comforted by paradoxes. Here is the very darkest and strangest of the paradoxes, and it is by all human testimony the most reassuring. I need not suggest what high and strange history awaited this paradox of the best man in the worst fortune. I need not say that in the freest and most philosophical sense, there is one Old Testament figure who is truly a type, or say what is prefigured in the wounds of Job.